Tabernacle tonight, and we're going to continue on with uh, what we started last week, the purpose of the Tabernacle. The purpose of the Tabernacle. We started it, we stopped at point five last week. We said it was the place where God speaks to the sinner. Where God speaks to the sinner. Alright, today we're going to start out with it being the place where God accepts the sinner. Let's take our Bible and go to Isaiah chapter 60. My voice is about gone, so if you hear that in the recording, it's because my voice is about gone. <laughs> and I'm going to push through this tonight as long as I can. <clears throat> so we'll try to make it through it. God will help me. If not, we'll re-record it. Amen. Well, Amen. What, what, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. Chapter 6 or 60? 60, I'm sorry, chapter 60, verse 7. I'll get somebody to read it for me. Um, Brother Jerry, read uh, chapter 60, verse 7 for me. Yes, sir. And I'll get you to read the next one, Brother Jack. All the flocks of Peter shall be gathered together unto the rams of the Nebuchadnezzar shall minister to them. Keep reading. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Notice that they come up with acceptance under my altar. Now God <clears throat> accepts the sinner in a certain place. Where's that place at? Well, in the Old Testament, it was the tabernacle. That's where the altar was. Later on, when God had the temple built, that became the temple. But where's that place in the New Testament? Where are the and that's right. So in the New Testament, Jesus Christ becomes the New Testament tabernacle, and he's the altar that you have to go to to be accepted. He is the altar. I'll show that to you in a little bit. Um, let's look at another verse concerning the Old Testament, though. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20. Brother Jack, I want you to read verses 40 through 42. I may stop you along the way. Ezekiel chapter 20. I want you to read verses 40, 41, and 42. <clears throat> For in mine holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. There will be, there will I accept them, and there will I require your offerings, and the first fruits of your oblations with all your holiness. All right, stop right there. I want you to notice something in that verse. In the future, in the millennium, there's a mountain. It's called the mountain of God's holiness and the mountain of the height of Israel. And the Bible says, there will I accept you. Okay? You can't just go anywhere. You can't just go to any place. It's not Mecca. It's not Rome. It's a specific place designated by God. And I want you to notice something else here. It says, there will I require your offerings. Plural. So that means that there's going to be offerings in the millennium. God did not do away with them permanently. He done away with them in the church age because he becomes the offering. But it's going to be reintroduced in the millennium and those offerings are going to take back up as a memorial just like the Last Supper is a memorial for us. See? And they're going to be pointing you back to what God did for the nation. Now, the next thing you need to know is the first fruits of your oblations will be there. Does anybody know what that means? 
That means tithing. <laughs> that means tithing has not been done away with. That means they're required to tithe their first fruits. And God calls them oblations, which means animal sacrifices. They're going to tithe off of those things. Those first fruits are going to be brought to God. All right, read the next verse. I will accept you with your sweet savor. Mm -hmm. I will accept you. When I bring you out of the people. And now, gather you out of the countries wherein you have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. Notice that the condition on verse 41 is contingent on verse 40. God will not accept you unless you do what he said in verse 40. What does verse 40 say again? You got to go to that mountain, and you got to bring what is it you're going to bring your offerings and your first fruits of your oblation and then I'll accept you a lot of people think that God will accept them any kind of way that is not true God requires you to come to him a certain way and he requires you to present yourself a certain type of way and if you come any other way than what he prescribes then you're going to be rejected just like Cain was you got to come God's way I was reading my notes today um, over there in Genesis chapter 4 when those boys were over there and giving an offering to the Lord. You know, Cain was the first one to come up with the idea of bringing an offering to the Lord. And he had taught that, he'd been taught that by Adam. Else how would he know to do it? And who taught Adam? God. First thing God taught Adam after the fall was you bring a sacrifice to me. And it has to be a blood sacrifice. It can't be just any kind of sacrifice. Cain thought he knew better than his daddy. So he decided to bring an offering that was not bloody. See? And his got rejected. Well, Abel followed suit, but he brought the right kind of offering. And it was accepted. And that's where the first murder took place. See? Jealousy. Envy. They, reject, they were rejected. Cain was rejected, and so Cain went out to take it out on his brother because he was doing it the right way. Make no mistake about it, folks. When you do things God's way, there's going to be people out there that hate you. There's going to be people out there that reject you. There's going to be people out there that if they could get their hands on you, they'd kill you. Amen. If they could get away with it. There's countries in the world right now that that is happening, and they do kill people. They kill Christians. Alright, read the next one. And you shall know that I am the Lord. For I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. Mm -hmm. He said, and you shall know when you come God's way. If you don't come God's way, you won't know. <laughs> Amen. I mean, there's a lesson in that, folks, that I want you to get out of this. You must come God's way. All right. Now, let's look at the New Testament reality. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Everybody hear me good? Uh -huh. All right. Brother Earl, read Ephesians 1 6 for me. Ephesians 1 and verse 6. <coughs> Let's read. Um, I want you to go back actually to verse um, 3 and go down to verse 6 and I'll stop you along the way. Okay. Start with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Stop. Right there, notice something there that a lot of people, when they're reading through those verses, miss. The spiritual blessings come one way. They come in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you're not getting spiritual blessings. The world may get blessings, or what they call blessings, but they are not getting spiritual blessings. 
That only comes by being in Christ Jesus and being in the heavenly places with Him. You have to be born again to experience spiritual blessings. Now what the world calls a blessing, God laughs at. And what God calls a blessing, the world laughs at. See? Alright, read the next verse. According, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Alright, stop right there. He hath chosen us how? In him before the foundation of the world. That messes up the Calvinist. The Calvinists have a hard time reading. Because when they read that verse, they say, God has chosen us before the foundation of the world. That's not what the verse said. The verse says that God hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Which means that you have to be in Christ first to be chosen. See? And the Calvinists messed that all up. They think, well, he picked this one and he condemned that one and he picked this one and he picked this one and he condemned that. That's the predestination stuff that's taking a biblical doctrine and perverting it. That's John MacArthur. That's um, most of your, um, uh, your, your grace churches. You know, they, they, if you see uh, grace in the name, a lot of times they're, they're Calvinists. That's your Presbyterians. Okay, that's your primitive Baptist. That's your hard shell Baptist. So they believe in that kind of stuff. So you know what it does? It kills soul winning. Because after all, if God's picked you and He didn't pick Him, who am I to change it? How can I change it? I can't. I'm wasting my time. Let God sort it out. No, this is, and it, it kills soul winning. Everybody that's ever embraced Calvinism cease to be a soul winner. I've never met a, a hyper-Calvinist that was a soul winner. Never. Not one time. That's your crowd at Bob Jones University. That's your crowd over at Tennessee Temple. That's your crowd down at Howells Anderson, a lot of them. That's your crowd that is in the universities of these Bible schools. Most of them are Calvinists. Okay? Not all of them, but most of them. The thing you need to know is you have to be in Christ first. And he chooses you based on how you respond to him. You got to respond to him first. And that means the gospel has to be given to you first. And then you hang in the balance until you pick one way or the other. And then God determines what you are in him or not in him. All right. And look at the next thing. That we'd be without blame before him, how? In love. You know what God is? Love. So you have to be in God first. You can't be without blame without being in God. You know, Tina Turner sang a song, what's love got to do with it? It's got everything to do with it. It's got everything to do with it. <laughs> Amen. Keep reading. Okay. Here's that word you were just talking about. Having predestined, yeah, predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Him according to the good pleasure of His will. All right. How are you predestinated? According to that verse. It's adoption of children. By how? By Jesus Christ to Himself. Now, hold your place there. Let me show you something. Go to Romans eight twenty nine. Jerry, read this one. 829. Uh-huh. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. All right. Now, if you took that verse alone, Calvinists do, they'll look at that and say, see, he predestinated you. But you didn't read the verse before it, did you? <laughs> read verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. You got to love God first. That's right. 
And if you don't love God, you're not in Him. There's, not a, there's no such thing as a Christian that doesn't love God. You ain't never met one in your life. Every Christian loves God. They may get upset with God. They may get angry because they don't understand something He's doing in their life. But that love does not go away. See? Alright, the Bible says in the next part, it says, to them who are the called. See, many are called, few are chosen. Jesus said that. And he calls you by the gospel. See? He calls you by the preacher getting up and preaching the gospel to you and dealing with you about giving your heart to Christ Jesus. Now, the choosing is dependent on how you respond to that. The choosing does not happen until you respond. See? If those disciples had said no when Jesus said, come and follow me, he would have kept stepping until he found somebody that would follow him. See? He wouldn't have sat there and said, well, now I've chosen you before the foundation of the world. Now I'm going to go against your will and I'm going to force you to come along over here with me. And, and we're going to force you into this thing. And whether you like it or not, it ain't like that. i tell you how it's like. Somebody asked me one time, are you an Armenian? That's somebody who believes you lose your salvation. Or uh, are you a Calvinist? And here's my response to them. And go home and think about it for a while and you'll come up with the same conclusion. I'm an Armenian until I get to Calvary. Once I get to Calvary, I become a Calvinist. <laughs> in other words, once I'm in Christ Jesus, you couldn't cause me to lose it to save your life. Up to that point, all bets are off the table. Until I say yes to the call. That's how it works. All right. Keep reading. Did you finish reading it? No, you didn't. One more verse there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go back to verse 6. Okay. No, you're, you're in verse 5, right? You just read verse 5. Yeah, you just read about Read verse 6. Yeah. To the praise and the glory of His grace, wherein... He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now there's more in that verse than you realize. You see that word made? If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Now Jesus Christ makes you something new when you come to him. And the Bible says that if the Son hath made you free, you are free indeed. It does not say set you free. It says made you free. That requires a new birth, a new creation, a new creature. You have been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. That means that God went inside of you and recreated you. See? And one day your body is going to conform to what has already happened inside of you. That's Romans 8. That's what you were just reading in Romans 8.29. The Bible says he hath made us accepted. How? In the beloved. Now that beloved there is the church. You have to be in Christ, in his body, to be accepted. See? You could argue that beloved is Jesus. Okay, but either way you go with that, it's still going to require you to do something. You know what it requires you to do? It requires you to be born again in order to be accepted. You are not going to be accepted outside of Jesus Christ. All right, that's that reality. Now, let's go to the next one here. Go to Leviticus. I'll have to get you all to do some reading for me tonight now so I can save my voice here so we can get through this. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20. Um, let me get over there to it. See how it looks. Chapter 4, verse 20. Let's see. 
All right. The next point I'm going to make here is, is the place, the tabernacle, where God forgives the sinner. It's the place where God forgives the sinner. Now with that, let's read verse 4, Brother Jack. You can start it off. Read, uh, Brother Jack, I want him to read Leviticus 4, verse 20. I'm sorry. Verse 20. And I want you to read verse 26 and verse 31 and verse 35. Start with verse 20. And then we'll go from there. Yes, sir. He shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for his sin offering. So shall he do with this, and the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be for giving them. Now notice verse 20 requires the person participating to do something. Let me tell you, your salvation is free. But it cost somebody something. It's not free in the grand scheme of things. It cost Jesus Christ something. Or else he would not have used the term, he purchased the church. There's a price to be paid there. Now Jesus paid the price. Because he paid the price, it's free to you. Just like our freedom in the United States of America. It's free to us. But make no mistake about it. It cost somebody something to have that freedom. It cost a lot of bloodshed on the front lines across the seas and across this country. People fighting and laying their lives down so you can have that freedom. And it's the same thing when it comes to spiritual matters. Jesus Christ shed his blood and purchased you so you can have the freedom that comes with Jesus Christ and that's where you get forgiven. Now in the tabernacle, that high priest had to do something. He had to take that bullock. And the Bible says here that he made an atonement for the Oma. And then they're forgiven. Not the other way around. God will not forgive the sinner until an atonement has been made. And if you go outside the atonement, you're not going to be forgiven. Somebody come along and say, well, I can do it a different way than offering this poor little bull. These environmental wackos, you know, that, that come around and say, these Peter crowd, you know, don't kill the poor little animal. You know, be a vegetarian. Go kid your grandma, okay? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to eat my meat. Amen. Amen. I'm going to eat my filet mignon. Yeah, you, can, right. you can eat vegetables and watch your hair fall out all day long if you want to. I'm going to eat meat. Amen. Amen. That stuff's a doctrine of demons over there in First Peter. I mean, First Timothy. The Bible says that they forbid to eat meats. That's a doctrine of devils. All right. Go down to verse 26 and read for me, brother. And he shall burn all his fat upon the altar, as the fat and the sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. Notice that. He's still got to make that atonement before the forgiveness happens. And I want you to notice something in the Old Testament that's clear when you get to the New Testament. People in the Old Testament, when they were going to that tabernacle and sacrificing those animals upon those altars and those high priests were making atonement for them, they were forgiven, but they were not cleared. That's right. They had to keep going back every year because it did not clear them. It only forgave them. Look at verse 20. Uh, look at verse 31 now, brother, and read that. That's the peace offering. And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken away from all the sacrifice of peace <coughs> offerings, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. That's where your Catholic Church comes in with the priesthood idea. They 
they, they usurp authority over God. The priests in the Old Testament were making an atonement for the people. But they were making an atonement until the high priest showed up, which is Jesus Christ. Once the high priest of our profession showed up, there's no more requirement of a Levitical priesthood in the church age. I have to specify that. It will show up again during the millennium, but only as a memorial. And notice here in this verse, again, there has to be an atonement made before the forgiveness happens. All right, go to verse 35 and read that one for me, brother. And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifices of the peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar, according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for the sins that he has committed. Now the first thing you need to notice there in verse 35 is that offering had to be set on fire. And I'll say this till the day I die. Jesus Christ was set on fire on the cross. He became the burnt offering. Do you know your Bible says, how many of you know your Bible says he was the Passover lamb? How many of you know that? Does anybody not know that? He was Passover lamb. Yeah. All right. If you go back and read Exodus, what was required of the Passover lamb, he had to be set on fire or the Passover lamb was rejected. Now, if Jesus is the Passover lamb, and he is, then when he's on that cross and he says, I thirst, there's more to it than just, just a human man sitting there on the cross saying, I'm thirsty. He's crying out what a man would say in hell if he was trying to get some water and the flames are all about him. Now Jesus went through a tremendous amount of suffering for us. Now I don't teach like Joyce Myers and all of them do that Jesus went to hell and had to be born again. That's heresy. All the suffering happened on the cross. It stopped there. See, but the devil has a sly way of taking the truth and perverting it. See? Jesus, the Bible says in Job chapter 30, was burning. If you read Psalm chapter 22, that's a prayer of Jesus on the cross. He's burning. The sin offering was required to be set on fire. Jesus became, became sin for us. I did not say he became a sinner. That's another heresy. He became the sin offering. And if you want to go through it, he fulfills every one of those offerings to the T. He's the peace offering. It had to be set on fire. He's the burnt offering. It had to be set on fire. He's the sin offering. It had to be set on fire. He's the Passover lamb. It had to be set on fire. Every time you turn around, there's fire which pictures the judgment of God on the sin. Now, did Jesus bear your sins? Then something had to happen on that cross to get rid of those sins. <laughs> All right, take your Bible and let's look at the next one here. Go to Leviticus chapter 6, verse 7. Jerry, read that one for me. Go back to verse 6 and read that, Jerry. Read 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7 in chapter 6. And he shall bring his treasures. Trespass. He shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish, blemish out of the flock, with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. Stop right there. There's a trespass offering. Did you know that God holds you accountable for your trespasses? Anybody know what a trespass is? That's a sin that you committed that you didn't know you committed. In ignorance. And God does not wink at it. God does not overlook it. He holds it accountable. 
That's why I get up with these guys. They get over here and, and they say, well, so-and-so couldn't possibly be saved. He's, he's done all these sins here. Well, how many have you done that you don't even know about? When Jesus forgave you your sins, he didn't just forgive you of the sins you've committed up to this point. He forgave you of all your sins, including the ones you ain't committed yet. He dealt with the whole thing at the cross. He got rid of the whole thing in one swipe. If he didn't, folks, he would have to go back to the cross and pay for the ones you ain't committed yet. That ain't happening. You understand what I'm saying? Sin, when Jesus went to the cross, he, he, he dealt with the whole thing. Trespass offering is a picture of that. Jesus Christ is getting rid of all the stuff that you're doing on a daily basis that you don't even realize you're doing wrong. Ain't that good news? I mean, if you think about that, that's pretty good news there. He's taking care of the stuff I do in ignorance. <laughs> All right, keep reading. Read the next verse. Verse 7. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and shall be forgiven him for anything of all that he hath done in trespassing there. See that thing? All right. God says he'll forgive it to you even in the thing that you didn't even realize you'd done. He'll forgive you. When the priest makes an atonement for you. Did Jesus make an atonement for those things? Sure he did. He got rid of all of it. Alright, let's look at the New Testament reality. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Brother Earl picked that one up. Who wants to read one? <laughs> I got another one here. Colossians 1, 14. Who wants to read that one? Anybody? All right, I'll let you read it, Jerry, when he finishes Ephesians. Verse 7. Uh-huh. He's going to marry each other. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. All right, now notice what he says there. In whom we have what? Redemption. 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 Through his blood. Now that's important that you notice that word being added there. They did not enjoy redemption in the Old Testament like you do in the New Testament. They only could experience forgiveness. Their sins were not cleared. They were just forgiven and pushed forward. In the New Testament, God not only forgives the sin which he didn't really have a basis for doing in the Old Testament, he clears the sinner. That's redemption. He purchased you. Redeem means to purchase back something that was lost. And God did that one way. What does the verse say? It says, through his blood. And that's another pet peeve of mine. You're not going to get redemption or forgiveness without the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And I don't mean the death. I mean the blood that was shed in his death. Amen. Amen. These slick, smooth-talking, educated asses that they call preachers, like John MacArthur running around and saying the blood of Christ was just like any other person's blood. He's a heretic. Amen. I don't care what kind of good stuff he's doing. He's still a heretic when it comes to that. Sitting around smooth talking people telling them it's not the blood of Christ. It's the death of Christ. Well, if that's the case, then why didn't, why didn't he go through and just get stoned? He had plenty of opportunities to do it. He had an opportunity to jump off the temple and die that way. He didn't do that, did he? <laughs> Amen. He could have got his head cut off. There's plenty of soldiers around with swords. He shows a specific way to do it. Because crucifixion drains the body of all the blood. That's a medical fact. Go look it up. He required that because that pictures everything in the Old Testament and it covers the whole shebang. And 
one swipe. It, require, it, it, it covers the fact that those blood sacrifices pictured him and the blood that those animals shed pictured him. The Bible says, <clears throat> in whom we have redemption through his blood. Don't you ever throw that word out. Those three words required to get saved. If you didn't get saved by getting washed in the blood, you didn't get saved. Amen. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches. There's those treasures of his grace. Now read Colossians 1.14 and see if it don't merit. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. Said that there in Ephesians too. So the devil comes along with his scholars and says, well, we don't need both of them. We'll just throw one of them out. So if you got any new Bible in Colossians 1.14, that verse is changed through his blood's missing. Because the devil don't want confirmation about what it requires to get you saved and redeemed. It's through his blood. Now, next point. Last point here. The tabernacle is the place where God receives the sinner. Go to Exodus 23, 15. 23, 15. 28, 38. Exodus 23, 15. Verse 15. Somebody read that for me. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month of Bib. For in it thou camest out of it from Egypt, and none shall appear before me. Empty. All right, the first thing I want you to notice is you got to keep the feast of unleavened bread. That bread has to be unleavened. You're to keep it. You're not to change it. I'm going to teach you something here real quick. That unleavened bread pictures the Word of God. And the Bible says you shall keep it. This King James Bible is unleavened. The word leaven means false doctrine, it means heresy, it means sin and the Bible says that this King James Bible is unleavened bread it has no sin in it it has no false doctrine in it and when you eat it, you will be protected and you will be satisfied thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee for in it thou camest out from Egypt the month of Abib and none shall appear before me empty. You can't go before God empty. Even now in the church age. If you're going to be accepted of God, you better come with an offering. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about you Christians. When you go before the Lord, you better have the right offering. And what is that offering? Jesus Christ. And you better have some unleavened bread that you can say, I'm eating this. This is my meal. Amen. Amen. A man that comes before God without the offering of Jesus Christ is a dead duck. Because you cannot appear before him empty. Alright, go to Exodus 28.38. Somebody read that one for me. You going to read that, Jerry? Yes, sir. All right, read that one for me. <clears throat> and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall be always 
Notice there, it's going to be upon Aaron's forehead. Now, if you go back and you study that thing out, especially over in Zechariah chapter 14, and that high priest um, and the and the descriptions of the garments and stuff, there's a plate that he had sitting right up here at his forehead, and it said, "Holiness unto the Lord." Okay. That was a reminder that everything we do is for God's holiness and for God's uh, pleasure. And you have to appear before him holy. And if you don't, you're going to die. And that's the same way in the church age. If you don't appear before God holy, you're going to die. You're going to drop off into hell when you take that last breath. The difference is, is what we know now in the church We've got a sacrifice. We've got an offering that's holy, and he took our place. So when God sees you now as a sinner, he sees you through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Go back to verse 36, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it, like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And in that thing, in verse 38, he says, that Aaron may do what? What's he going to do in verse 38? He's going to bear the iniquity of the holy things. The holy things, that's you and me. If you want a picture of that in the New Testament. Jesus Christ bears the iniquity of the holy things. Are you called a saint? Do you know what the word saint means? It means holy. It means sanctified. It means set apart. And you know what Jesus Christ does, Sister Debbie? He bears your sins. And you know what that means? He's bearing the iniquity of the holy things. See that thing? Alright, the Bible says here, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always, it's not going to go away, upon his forehead that they may be what? You're not going to be accepted outside of that. That's the tabernacle. Alright, let's look at the New Testament reality. God now ex receives us in Christ Jesus. We must not appear empty. We must bring something when we come. What is it? We must bring our sins and our bodies. Go to Hebrews thirteen fifteen, Brother Earl, read that one. Jack, get Romans 12, 1. And Jerry, get uh, 1 John 1, 9. Peter was 13, what? 13, 15. By him, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Notice that even now, after you got saved, you still bring sacrifices to God. That's right. You're called a nation of priests. I'm a priest. You're a priest. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. What does that mean, preacher? That means that when we come to God, we bring a sacrifice. But it's not an animal. It's our self. The sacrifice of praise to God. Look at what he said again. Read it one more time. <clears throat> by, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Notice it says continually. It's not a one time does it and you're done. You should give the sacrifice of praise every day to God. And if you don't, you're sinning. You're sinning. Thank God for the trespass offering, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You're to offer that sacrifice of praise by Him, Jesus Christ. And the fruit of your lips should speak to that praise. You should praise God in everything you do. 
You should praise God when you get up in the morning. You should praise God when you get down in your bed at night. You should praise God when you're at your meal getting ready to eat and stuff your face. You should praise God when you go to the store. You should praise God when you come home. You should praise God when you're talking to your family. You should praise God all the time. And if you don't, you're not doing what God requires. So Jesus knows your weakness. He knows you're frail. He knows you're but dust. So, he's got the trespass to cover you. Trespass offering. All right, read that next one, Romans 12, 1. Who's got that? All right, read that one for me. I beseech you, brethren, or I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. See that? Holy Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service. There's not anything spectacular that you're doing. You to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And that term present means that the priest is coming up there. And he gives you an Old Testament visual there. Well, that priest takes that lamb that's tied up and he's presenting it to God. Before he put that thing on the altar, that priest would take that thing and he would elevate it up to God. And he would say, I'm offering this to you. Accept it. Then he'd lay it up there on that brazen altar. And it would burn up. The first thing he had to do, though, was slit his throat and pour the blood out on the side. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Then he laid it up there. See? There's so many pictures there that we could talk about. Alright. What did he say again? Read it, read, read, read it one more time for me. Make sure I didn't miss anything. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, mm -hmm. by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Holy and acceptable. Your body is not yours. It's God's. And you're to present it back to Him. Just like your money is not yours. It belongs to God. God gave you everything you have. Amen. Don't tell me you can't do something with your money when it comes to what God told you to do with it. Tithing, I mean. We'll go ahead and just be specific. You can pay your tithes. You choose not to. And if you choose not to, you choose to put a curse on yourself. If you pay your tithes, you're giving God back what already belongs to Him to start with. It's not your money. <laughs> it's God's money. He just allows you to have 90% of it to enjoy as you please. And it's reasonable. Ten cents on a dollar, for example. And it's not only that, let's go to prayer. It's your reasonable service to pray. It is your reasonable service to be a soul winner. You should be a soul winner and that should be on your mind constantly. Passing out tracts, getting people saved, telling people about Jesus Christ, figuring out how can I get them to sit down and listen to what i got to say in a way that I can get them to get their attention. Amen. Street preaching is your reasonable service. You say, I can't do all that stuff, preacher. You can't. <laughs> really? You're going to stand up there on the judgment day and tell God you couldn't do it? After there's so many people that came before you that did it, that had worse problems than you got? <laughs> I'm amazed at people that say they can't come to church. Yeah. On a Wednesday night, on a Sunday night, let's just park it there for a minute, shall we? Listen, they say they can't do it. They, they, they're not able to do it. But let me ask you something. You can't do what God requires. God requires you to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And assembling is required according to the Scriptures. And you can't sit in a Wednesday night meeting or a Sunday night meeting, but you can sit there in that front of that television and look at it for four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours. 
You can drive two or three hours to go to Raleigh or Durham or Chapel Hill or Greensboro and go shopping to satisfy your own lust. You can sit in front of that computer and play games till wee hours of the morning. But you can't do something for God in church. That's what I say to it. There's going to come a reckoning day before the Lord when you, you try that stuff with Him. All the stuff that people put up in front of me, sometimes I say, well, I wonder how that would feel. I wonder if they would tell Jesus that to His face. <laughs> Amen. It's quieter here than I know that. And my voice is about gone. Don't worry. You ain't got to put up with me much longer. My voice will be gone in a few minutes. But while i got breath, I'm going to praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And I'm going to tell you, God wants you to do it. It's important. It's important. It's your reasonable service. That's what he said. Present your bodies. How do you do that? How does that look in reality? It looks like this. What we've got here tonight. Do you think I felt like getting in this pulpit tonight? <laughs> Absolutely not. I feel horrible. Amen. But I've got to be the example to show you how it looks. To put this flesh into subjection. When those men go walking across the jungles and they walk for two and three hours to get to a church service where they're standing in three foot of water and mud to hear a preacher preach for three hours and people can't come on a Sunday night to a prayer meeting or a preaching meeting or a teaching meeting. They got something to answer for at the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be horrible. Amen. All right, well, we'll leave that alone now. Go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Who's got that? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Look at this. We confess our sins. All right. All right, stop right there. 1 John 1, 9 says, If who? We. That is not a lost man. A lost man does not confess his sins. A saved man confesses his sins. That is written to a church. That's written to believers. Ain't that in your New Testament? That's written to people that know Jesus Christ. He says, if we, now I've heard some Christians, the reason I'm harping on this is because I've heard some Christians say, after you get saved, you don't have to confess your sins no more. That's dangerous. Because the Bible does tell you to confess your sins. A lost man does not confess his sins. He confesses Jesus Christ to get saved. But a man, once he's saved, he has to go to that labor that water labor, and get a daily cleansing before the Lord before he can have his sacrifice and offering accepted to God. And a lot of Christians go before the Lord with dirty, filthy feet. And God will not accept your sacrifice Amen. until you get that thing cleaned up. I'm talking to you Christians now. Read the verse, brother. If we confess our sins, uh -huh. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And do what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you confess your sins and get in the habit of doing that on a daily basis, God says He'll cleanse you from all right, unrighteousness. When I get before the Lord in the morning, I pray before Him and I say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. I'm a, I'm a sinner and I, I sin every day and I, I miss the mark every day. Not only forgive me for what I know I've done wrong, forgive me for what I don't know I've done wrong. Help me, Lord, to stay clean and purified before you so that anything I do going forward, I can walk in the will of God and I can be accepted. And what I'm doing for you, as far as my service, as far as my work for you. Some Christians get up dirty and go to bed dirty. <laughs> Look at verse 7 and read that, Brother Jerry. But if we walk in the light, uh -huh. he is in the light, uh -huh. fellowship one with another. All right, watch right there. If we walk in the light, what's the light? The Word of God. As he is in the light, he's in this book. 
We have what? Fellowship. Fellowship. One with another. You know what messes up a fellowship? What messes up a fellowship more than anything else is when Christians get in church and get in their own, stuck in their own way, and they don't allow God to give them that daily cleansing, and bitterness starts creeping in, envy starts creeping in, jealousy starts creeping in, and they don't confess those sins, and they get bigger and bigger until the church splits. That's what happens. If you're going to stay in fellowship one with another, you've got to have the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanse you. Read the verse again. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Alright, now read verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not tell the truth. You can't have fellowship with Jesus Christ and walk in darkness. If you say you are, you're lying. I'm talking about you Christians. you got to go to that altar and get cleansed. Or you're walking in darkness, practically. I know doctrinally you can't, but I'm talking about a practical walk now. I'm talking about your fellowship, not your relationship with God. It uses the term fellowship. There's a lot of Christians that are not in fellowship with God today because they refuse to do what God told them to do. Amen. That preacher's requiring too much of me. No, 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 no. Don't put it on the preacher. <laughs> For a man to know to do right and do with it not to him, it is what? Don't put it on me. <laughs> I got my own problems. <laughs> Amen. Go to chapter 2, verse 1, and look at this one. And this is where we're going to close. <clears throat> read that one. Somebody read that. Uh, Brother Earl, read that one. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. One chapter over. Okay. Verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you. Stop right there. Who's he writing to? Is he right to save people or lost people? Saved. According to this, save people, right? My little children. That's a bishop's heart to his congregation. You know what I say before the Lord when I'm praying about you folks? I said, Lord, protect my little children in the faith today and grant them A, B, and C. That's my prayer to you guys every day for you guys. And I refer to you guys before the Lord as my little children. Because that's a bishop's heart. That's a pastor's heart. You are my children in the faith. I have begotten you unto a lively hope, he says. Keep reading. Um, that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. All right. You as a Christian are going to sin. Go ahead and bank on it. While you live and breathe, you're going to mess up. That's not the time to give up. That's the time to get on your face before God and get closer to Him than you've ever gotten. And let Him be your forgiveness. Just like this tabernacle was God's forgiveness for the children of Israel. And that's where He received them. In Jesus Christ, we are received today. And that's where we get our forgiveness. But not just our forgiveness, our clearing. See? You say, preacher, why do I have to confess my sins if they're already all handled and forgiven? Because you, you got to understand something. There's something called your standing with God and your position with God. Your standing with God is how you walk on a daily basis. Your position with God is what Christ Jesus did for you at the cross. Your standing is a daily walk. This is why the early church practiced foot washing. 
as a picture of them getting that daily cleansing. You don't see too much of that anymore. But um, bless your heart, it should be done as a picture. Just like communion should be done as a picture. Now, I'm going to close right there. I hope I give you enough tonight through this frail voice of mine to get you thinking this week about some things about the Lord and get you closer to the Lord than what you were when you walked in that door back there. I want you to get as close to God as you can possibly get. And I want you to fall in love with Jesus Christ more than you ever have. And I want you to read this Bible and I want you to get in it and I want you to master it. You say, I'll never master it. No kidding. <laughs> But at least try. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and put an effort forth, man. Amen. And sometimes I have to say some hard things and some difficult things, but I do it because I love you. And I'm trying to keep you on the straight and narrow, you know, so you don't stray like a lot of sheep do. Sheep will stray if they don't have a shepherd. Remember that. Amen. A lot of people don't have a pastor. They got a a zoo ringleader. <laughs> you know. <laughs> that's not us here. Anybody got any questions tonight?